The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check out additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed in the following program are strictly those of the hosts or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Busy, Stressed, and Food Obsessed with host and author of the award-winning book of the same name, Lisa Lutan. Lisa has amazing tips to help you slow down, get healthy, manage your time, improve your relationships, and deal with stress. Now, here is Lisa Lutan. Hey everyone, it's Lisa and welcome to Busy, Stressed, and Food Obsessed Radio where you're introduced to my favorite health and wellness rock stars. Plus, you get tips that you can start using right away to feel healthier and happier. Today's show is incredibly special for me. I'm going to be chatting with my hero, Janine Roth. Although Janine doesn't know it, through her books and workshops, she has been my teacher and mentor for many years and no doubt to many other health coaches as well. Over the last 30 years, Janine has worked with hundreds of thousands of people to help them transform difficult relationships with food and life. Her pioneering approach outlines the link between compulsive eating and perpetual dieting with deeply personal and spiritual issues that go far beyond food, weight, and body image. She's the author of nine books, including the number one New York Times bestseller, Women, Food, and God, and has appeared on just about every show you can imagine, from Oprah, Good Morning America, and every single other one out there. And her work appears in every magazine and newspaper as well. Personally, I was lucky enough to attend one of Janine's retreats at Kripalu, and I can honestly say it was life changing. Mm -hmm. So it is truly an honor to say, Janine, welcome to the show. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for telling me that about Kripalu. I love hearing that. Oh, it was great. And we can talk more about your your retreats a little bit later in the show. But I like to start asking every guest my same Lisa five ask every guest questions. (laughs) So number one, what did you have for breakfast today? I had uh, a lot of vegetables and two poached eggs. Yum. What is your favorite form of exercise? Oh, by the way, with a lot of ghee in it, clarified butter and salt. It's very important to add that. (laughs) Um, Yes, we need our fats. Absolutely. Yes, we do. What's my favorite form of exercise? I'd say there are two forms. I love hiking. We live, you know, near some gorgeous hikes. And also, I do some lightweight training every day at home just with free weights. And I love that because of how strong I feel. What's a habit you're trying to either break or add to your life? A habit that I'm trying to break or add? I would say catching my uh, loop of negative thinking that seems to be a default of mine. It's where my mind automatically goes. Catching it when it starts and either questioning my thoughts or disengaging from them. That's definitely something I work on every day. That's a great one. Mm -hmm. How do you spend the first hour of your day? First hour... Well, I meditate, and I have my own version of meditation, uh, which I do lying down in bed when I open my eyes. So I spend probably anywhere from 20 minutes to half an hour doing that, uh, sensing my body, just sort of feeling the life force, noticing my thoughts, like that, putting a lot of practices I've learned over the years together. Then... Usually my husband is up before me, so then I go find him. He's usually working. We both work at home, and he's in his office, so I go find him, and we either sit down and just talk to each other about our dreams or thoughts or whatever on our minds, or we cuddle. 
So that's the first hour. Oh, yeah. And playing with our dog, Izzy. That's very important. Yeah. <laughs> I try Love to have that. that first hour be um, uh, like a guide, a compass, aligning myself in a direction that feels life-giving and positive uh, daily. So, you know, it's just setting, you know, the day right from the beginning. It's a beautiful way to start your day. Mm. My, my last question is, who is someone in your life that inspires you? Oh, wow. I, it's really hard to, to narrow that down to one person, um, so I'm not going to. I would say the two main people that inspire me. My husband, um, because he's so, um, well, he's funny, and he is able, he just has a brightness to him that um, sort of like I, I feel so lucky that he shines it on me as well as many other people. And I would say the second person, but it's more like a group of people that inspire me, are the spiritual teachers I've had, and I've had many. And so I, I think about them, and they're with me all the time, and they are inspirations for me because of how I see they've lived their lives. They walk their talk. I'm inspired just hearing that. You'll have to tell us later who those spiritual teachers are. I'm truly intrigued. If you want to share any, please do. <laughs> You're going to ask me that later? Or yes. <laughs> well, let's talk about that right now, actually. Who are some of those spiritual teachers? Well, one of them is dead. And, but he still inspires me. It's a man named Nisar Gadada who wrote a book called I Am That. Um, another one of them is dead, Stephen Levine, who's a Buddhist teacher. He was one of my first teachers that I ever had um, when I lived uh, uh, in Santa Cruz. Uh, and I read his books, and I went to his workshops, and uh, he just was quite inspirational to me about forgiveness and pain and things like that, turning the mind around from its usual tracks, which I told you at the beginning I'm still doing. Um, Eckhart Tolle was, is another teacher of mine. I, I had a conversation with him a couple of years ago, and I had the good fortune of spending a couple of days with him and saw, again, how he walked his talk and the peace and the clarity and the stillness with which he approached everything, even ordering food in a restaurant. I have another teacher who I see um, not so frequently anymore, but um, her name is Jean, and she's just been a spiritual guide for me for 24 years. So, oh, Byron Katie. You know, there are a lot of people I've read, not really studied with one-on-one, but whose work inspires me because I see what's possible for a human being. And I always believe that if it's possible for one person, it's possible for anybody. So, so true. And I'm, I'm a big fan of many of those as well. They've really, really impacted my life too. And so I want to talk about your journey because I'm guessing as a little girl, you didn't imagine you would grow up and be, be an emotional eating expert and talking about all these things. So tell us a little bit of this journey about how you got to be doing the work that you do. Yeah, I had a uh, a thing, as they say, with food almost from the get-go. Um, I was chubby as a kid, though not fat, and then when I was 11, I started going on diets. And that was the beginning of my compulsive eating days because I became obsessed with food, with what and when and how to eat, and also believing that all my unhappiness, I was, I was sort of a miserable kid. Um, my family wasn't very happy. My parents were conflicted. There was addiction and abuse in our family. And I started believing, because kids are pretty much out of control of what's going on, that if only I could lose weight and be thinner, everything that was wrong would be right. So I pinned all of my hopes on losing weight. And I became obsessed, absolutely obsessed and insane. 
and stayed that way for the next 17 years, losing and gaining mm, over a thousand pounds. But I would say that's pretty that's a pretty conservative estimate. I could gain 10 pounds one week, lose it the next week, starving myself, then binging, starving and binging, taking X-lax diet pills, throwing up, spitting up, uh, fasting for weeks at a time, going on Weight Watchers, going on Atkins. Atkins was, in a way, a predecessor to the paleo diet, um, although I don't think I've ever read that anymore, but it was a lot of protein and nobody was talking about good fats then, but anyway, it was fat and protein pretty much. Um, so I, at 28, I was then the fattest I'd ever been because I had been anorexic for a while, and I had then, after the anorexic phase, doubled my weight. I was 80 pounds when I was anorexic, and then when I, when I just couldn't stand it anymore, I went on a binge to end all binges, gained 80 pounds in two months, and at that point, I realized I couldn't live like that anymore. I just couldn't. Uh, so I wanted to kill myself first, and then I, 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 I realized... I gave myself a couple of days. I was hatching a plan to kill myself and then realized through reading some books in a bookstore, specifically Fat as a Feminist Issue, this was 1978, I realized that I had never actually been curious about my relationship with food. I had always just wanted it to go away. I had wanted to get rid of myself. I had wanted to get rid of my thoughts. I was convinced I was defective, damaged, and doomed. And so there was never any thought that what I was doing with food might make sense to, in some world, if I could look at it in a different way. And I realized, oh, maybe it actually does make sense. Maybe I'm trying to get through to myself in some way that I haven't been willing to hear or listen. And so I gave myself a couple of weeks of not dieting. I decided instantly not to diet ever again. And also of inquiring into my relationship with food. And that changed everything for me. That was a radical shift. I think I remember you talking about that at your retreat. And I think you, was it cookies or cookie dough? And you Yes, just it was ate. cookie dough. Yes. <laughs> Can you share that story? Well, I will, but I will, with a caveat, because I was much younger then. <laughs> this, was, <laughs> this was 39 years ago. So I was much younger then, and I wouldn't recommend anybody do that. People listen to that story, and they think, oh, good, I think I'm going to go do that. But um, I was so um, deprived at that point, and what I now believe is that deprivation, guilt, shame, punishment, and fear will never, ever, ever lead to any kind of long-lasting change. They might work in the moment but they won't work in the long term, which is why so many people gain weight on diets because they keep going off of them because they feel deprived and they feel afraid of themselves, and that doesn't lead to change. In my own case, the only way I could think of to uh, break out of what I was doing with food was to do the opposite. And although I had been binging for months, two months, before that, during which I had gained 80 pounds, I had always felt ashamed and guilty and um, like I didn't deserve to live, really. And I certainly didn't deserve to eat food in front of God and everyone. And the chocolate chip cookie dough weeks, during which I ate mostly chocolate chip cookie dough, because that was my favorite food in those days, um, was about me proving to myself that I deserve to be here. I deserve to take up space. And I deserve to eat what I wanted to eat. And the only thing I could think that I wanted to eat, because I had grown up on sugar pretty much. That was the big taboo and the big forbidden food. So the way I could prove that to myself was to only eat sugar for a couple of weeks. And after those weeks... What happened? Like, what happened for you that was this big shift? Well, you know, what happened to me is what I see happening 
to the people I work with as well. The main thing here, and I, I really want to emphasize this, is not actually that I ate cookie dough, or it's not actually that some of my students will go out and eat Sara Lee fudge brownies or Krispy Kremes or cronuts or potato chips or whatever it is. Uh, the, the main thing that I think all of us could so benefit in learning is the messages that we're conveying to ourselves about the food we're eating. So my message was I didn't deserve to, to take up space. I didn't deserve to eat, really. And I certainly didn't deserve to eat what I wanted to eat and even take the time to decide what that was. And that's what I see with my students as well, that when they give themselves permission to be themselves, it's not just eating what they want to eat because eating is only an expression. What you eat is really only an expression of of. The way you treat yourselves, I, I, you know, or the way we treat ourselves, I often say we eat the way we live. And um, many people don't understand that. It makes it sort of, yeah, right, we eat the way we live. Huh? What do you mean? And it's that our eating is an expression of thoughts that we have, beliefs we have, like I don't deserve to be here, or I can't have anything I really, really want. I'm a failure in work or I'm a failure in relationships and therefore I might as well, you know, be able to do one thing that brings sweetness in my life, which is to eat. It's not so much the food that we need to examine, although yes, what we eat does matter because of the effect it has on our bodies. It's the beliefs we're feeding ourselves. That's a perfect breaking point. We are going to break, but I can't wait to hear more when we get back about how what we eat is really a reflection of how we live. Stay tuned. We will be back with Janine Roth right after the break. A fresh look at today's health. Voice America Health & Wellness. Are you a busy, stressed, and hungry go-getter who knows what to do to get healthier but has trouble doing it? The problem with popular diets is that they were designed for other people, not you. Sure, they might work for the short term, but for the longer term results, you need a plan designed specifically for your unique body and lifestyle. How about the stress in your life? Do you ever stop and take a deep breath? Do you know what all this stress is doing to your health? Healthy living strategist and author of Busy, Stressed, and Food Obsessed, Lisa Lutan will get you on your way with coaching, online courses and challenges, and even retreats. You will learn tips and strategies to help you calm down, get healthy, and make you feel and look better than ever. For a limited time, Lisa Lutan is offering a free 15-minute breakthrough session to help you get started feeling better right away. Just visit HealthyHappyAndHip.com to get your free 15-minute breakthrough strategy session. That's Healthy, Happy, and Hip. Yes, you heard it right. HealthyHappyAndHip.com and enter your info in the contact page. Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings of the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our wall. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. These days, everyone is looking for information on staying young, healthy, and fit. The Voice America Health and Wellness Network is here to help you on your quest to better health and a better you. We talk about everything from diet, fitness, and aging to substance abuse, personal growth, mental health, and much more. Learn from our experts who cover health and wellness from traditional and holistic perspectives. Tune in to the Voice America Health and Wellness Network. Healthy living starts here. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. You 
are listening to Busy, Stressed, and Food Obsessed. To reach the program today, please call 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. Feel like sending an email instead? Send it to Lisa at HealthyHappyAndHip.com. Now, back to Busy, Stressed, and Food Obsessed. Here again is Lisa Lutan. Welcome back to the show. I'm here with Janine Roth, and we are talking about food and how food is a reflection of our life. So, Janine, you were starting to explain to us how food is so much more than just what we eat, how it really is important to take a look at it and start understanding our life. So, one of the things you've been talking about lately is these keys to making shifts with food, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yes. Um, How this came about is that I've been teaching retreats for years, and some of my longtime students who have completely resolved their issues with food and have started working on other areas of their lives using the same principles that I've taught at the retreats um, have shown me what these three keys are. So I have... I've watched them and how they've changed, and I've seen what they've done. What what are the key shifts in their lives that they've made to transform their relationship with food and their lives, their belief about themselves? And so in relationship to their bodies, in relationship to their families, in relationship to their creativity, in relationship to their lives. And so what I've seen is the first one, is about reclaiming or owning the connection with your own body. Now, a lot of people don't like it when I say this because their first response is, my body is the most interesting, I mean, the least interesting thing about myself. I don't like my body. I don't want it. This is the source. My body is the source of pain for me. My thighs are too big. I have chicken wing arms. I need to lose 20, 30, 40 pounds. Why should I reclaim my connection with my body? And it's a good question, of course, and what I can tell you is what I see on the ground from working with people, we teach at our retreats a boundary exercise where a student of mine felt the boundaries of her own skin for the first time. In other words, she, I, I ask everybody to do it uh, called a red string exercise where they fill out the space and they, in their bodies, and the space that they have to live this life. And what most people do is live in their heads, and yet they're walking around with this body attached to to their heads. And this body has schlepped them around, has has held their children, has reached for food, has been a loyal servant to them, and they've paid no attention to this body until they've gotten sick or it's broken down. Guilty! (laughs) <laughs> right. You know, I realized, you know, a couple of years ago, I broke um, some vertebra in my back, and I realized that, wow, I had not really paid attention to my back. I knew my back was in back of the front, and I knew it was back there, but I realized, and I, I have ri- since written about this, that I was kinder to my jade plant than I was to my body. I treated my cell phone better than I treated my body. I kept my cell phone out of the heat. I recharged it when it was, quote, tired. I made sure that it was clean and, you know, it was kept in its case. I always knew where it was. Now, of course, you can't lose your body, but you can sort of lose connection to your body. Most of us don't rest. When we're tired, we don't eat when we're hungry. We don't stop when we've had enough, and we don't feed our bodies foods that we love. We don't ask for touch when we need it. We don't ask for um, alone time when we need it. There are so many ways of being kind to and tender with this body right now, right now, no matter what weight you're at, because no matter what weight you're at, your body is still is still working for you. And it would work in my experience with myself and my students, like with this person, Mary, I was telling you about, who felt into her body really thoroughly, like just the life force in your body, and realized she could learn to say no 
I don't want to, don't come any closer. She could say, yes, come closer. Most women are not taught to do that. We think our bodies belong. This is a gross generalization, but it's what I found to be true. Most of us, I certainly felt like this, felt like my body sort of belonged to other people in a way. That Absolutely. You know, I think... I'm so yeah. sorry. We, I think that I didn't realize I had a body till I was around 40 years old. I yes, think that right. We're, yeah, we're taught that our mind is everything and yes. that we have to listen to our mind. And I think I can say my clients are the same when we talk about that mind-body connection. They're like, oh, my God, I just got it. I never realized I even had a body. So I totally agree with what you're saying. Yes. And it's important because the thing is, you're feeding this body. So the relationship with food is directly related to your connection with your body or your willingness, sometimes I call this, to inhabit this body. It's the physical piece of the universe you've been given. And yes, we sort of drop it when we die. Who knows what happens after we die? But nonetheless, we have this until we die. What are we going to do with this? And the worse you treat it, the more exhausted and depressed you become. And the kinder you are to this body, it becomes like a friend. It, It sort of becomes your best friend. One of my students said to me last week, wow, I realize I've been so tender with my children. I've been so attuned to their needs and kind to them. I have not been like that at all with my body, and I am being kind and tender with my body for the first time in her life. She's 53. Wow. I mean, don't you feel just so light just hearing that? It's It's just beautiful. It is beautiful. Yep. And and explain, I think, to our listeners, how do we start being kind to our body? Because I think we hear these things, but then in actuality, many people, we don't know how to actually do that. Yes, good question. Thank you for that. You can start for three minutes a day. That's part of the practice that I do, Lisa. You know, when I wake up in the morning, I, I ask, I just listen to my body. Is it cold? Is it warm? Is it pulsing? Is it vibrating? Are there places where it's contracted? Are there places where I feel pressure? What does it feel like in my chest? What does my back feel like right now? What happens when I breathe? Breathing is an immediate connection to this body because it's what sustains this body. You can't live without breath, so you take a long belly breath and you feel what that feels like in your body. This is not hard. It, anybody can do it. All it takes is three minutes, but it takes the willingness to do it. That's the thing. You have to sort of be willing to say, okay, I will do this. So for, let's say, three minutes when you wake up in the morning, you take three long breaths, belly breaths, and you take them from your feet all the way up to your head and around again to your feet, and you just sense, ask yourself, What's happening in this body? It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be complicated. But your body at that point will become more and more alive because you will start a relationship. And what you pay attention to pays attention to you. So So it will start speaking to you. And I started adding something to my own practice just about two weeks ago Yeah. that in addition to listening to my body, I do a little scan, my body, my emotions, my intellectual side, all these things. And then I go, what does it need from me today? Yes, good and idea. that's been a really helpful little addition to it. And I go, okay, it needs a little more rest. It needs a little more movement. It needs a little more this or that. And it's been really transformational for me. Yes, that's beautiful. I think that's a key question. And I think another thing people can do is download one of those apps that have bells, beautiful sounds of gongs, and set it to ring, you know, during a, it could be every two hours, it could be every three hours or five hours, it could be every 20 minutes, whatever you're comfortable with. It rings, and it's a gorgeous ring, and when it rings, you stop, and you take a breath. And you ask yourself, you can ask yourself that question. That's a beautiful question. What does my body need right now? 
It probably won't say, I need more time on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I need more time on the Internet. I need more time watching these silly YouTubes. Although I love YouTubes of cute puppies and kittens and things like that. You know, that's that's sort of a distraction from really listening to what my body needs in this moment. So that's another thing people can do. And I believe that's how we start getting to work on that portal to learning about our bodies and understanding better to relate with food, correct? Yes, because if you really listen to your body, that's the other thing. It probably will not tell you that it wants sugar all the time. Bodies just don't do well with that. You go very high and very low. And, you know, we need this body to sustain us, to be with us till our last dying breath. And hopefully that last breath is later rather than sooner. But if you really listen to your body, it's not that it won't ever say, wow, I'd really like something sweet now. It won't say, I want something sweet all the time. I think a lot of times it'll say, I want a nap. A nap, being outside is a good Mm -hmm. thing. You know, just going outside Sometimes it will say, I want contact with another member of this human tribe because we are members of a tribe and there's comfort in contact. So, yes. So, So that that goes into the second key, which is um, to learn how to, once you start being in connection, and they, they, these aren't particularly progressive. You can start anywhere. The second key is to um, be kind to the most awful, painful, shameful feelings and thoughts you have. Now, that sounds counterintuitive, but what I've learned is that when we bully ourselves, what happens is that we collapse and we do the opposite. And when I bully myself, when I shame myself, what happens, I I sort of turn into a two-year-old, a regressed, paralyzed, collapsed two-year-old who feels like she wants to walk into her husband's body and just is is non-functional. When I I work with people about this, um, turning around this kindness that women in particular shower on other people but not onto themselves, something in them flowers. Something in them relaxes. I'm thinking of a particular, another student of mine, and um, her name is Jody, and she has started this practice where she will turn to herself. We call it the Oh Sweetheart practice. And instead of saying, you know, um, oh, Darn, I can't believe I just, let's just do something very basic here, tripped over that and just, why didn't I see it? What's wrong with me? I can't believe I did that. I can't. She'll turn to herself and say, oh, sweetheart, I'm so sorry you did that. Just in that moment, there's a turn from, oh, no, you dumb thing to, oh, sweetheart, I'm so sorry. And so that developing that kind relationship with oneself and being willing, this is counterintuitive, I know, but this is a radical shift to turn towards rather than away from the feelings that you think you could only get, if you were, you would be fine if you could only get rid of. Those feelings, it turns out, all they want are to be recognized, like your body, just to be recognized. I'd love to share a quote of yours that I love. Yeah. It's, for some reason, we are truly convinced that if we criticize ourselves, the criticism will lead to change. If we are harsh, we believe we will end up being kind. If we shame ourselves, we believe we end up loving ourselves. It has never been true. Not for a moment that shame leads to love. Only love leads to love. Yeah. I actually put that quote in my book because I loved it so much. Oh, yeah, it's true. And and that's the thing, you know, it's so true. And I think most of us don't believe that. We really, really, really don't believe that. We really believe that if only we could shame ourselves enough, we would 
be wonderful, loving human beings. If, you know, and what I say to people is the means cannot be separated from the end. The process is itself the goal. How you get there, and I put there in quotes, is who you will be when you arrive there. So if you shame, deprive, fear, and torture yourself, you will end up ashamed, deprived, afraid, and tortured. You might also be thin for five minutes, but you won't stay thin because you will be ashamed and afraid of yourself. So a lot of the work I do with people is to reverse the negative conditioning that we've grown up with in our culture and from our caretakers to, wow, turn around. There's there's a beauty to behold here. And... Um, you know, that Galway Canal poem that I quote in Women, Food, and God, sometimes it's necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness. And th- that's what this process is, learning how to look at ourselves and behold the loveliness, which is a far distance, I know, from where most people are. Janine, we're going to go to break right now, but when we come back, we're going to talk about that loveliness further. Stay tuned. I'm here with Janine Roth, and we'll be back after the break. A fresh look at today's health. Voice America Health & Wellness. Are you a busy, stressed, and hungry go-getter who knows what to do to get healthier but has trouble doing it? The problem with popular diets is that they were designed for other people, not you. Sure, they might work for the short term, but for the longer term results, you need a plan designed specifically for your unique body and lifestyle. How about the stress in your life? Do you ever stop and take a deep breath? Do you know what all this stress is doing to your health? Healthy living strategist and author of Busy, Stressed, and Food Obsessed, Lisa Lutan will get you on your way with coaching, online courses and challenges, and even retreats. You will learn tips and strategies to help you calm down, get healthy, and make you feel and look better than ever. For a limited time, Lisa Lutan is offering a free 15-minute breakthrough session to help you get started feeling better right away. Just visit HealthyHappyAndHip.com to get your free 15-minute breakthrough strategy session. That's HealthyHappyAndHip. Yes, you heard it right. HealthyHappyAndHip.com and enter your info in the contact page. Have you become a member yet? Sign up now to become a member of Voice America. It's always free and easy. Plus, you get to take advantage of some great member benefits. Get unlimited access to millions of hours of on-demand content across all of our channels. Keep track of your favorite episodes, shows, and hosts in your own customizable library. Find out what shows you might be interested in based on your favorites. Plus, you get insider access with our newsletter. Membership gives you more. Sign up at voiceamerica.com and click register at the top right. Now you can take your favorite Voice America radio program with you anywhere. Sign up for our mobile app if you have an iPhone, Android, or BlackBerry. The Voice America interactive radio player, powered by Aircast, gives you the freedom to listen to any of our programs anywhere, live, and on demand. No registration is required. Listen to your favorite Voice America hosts and discover new ones. Download the Voice America mobile app for iPhone, Android, or BlackBerry, powered by Aircast. Visit the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. Follow us on Twitter at VoiceAmericaTRN. Get the lowdown on guests, new shows, and your favorites. That's VoiceAmericaTRN. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. are listening to Busy, Stressed, and Food Obsessed. To reach the program today, please call 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. Feel like sending an email instead? Send it to Lisa at HealthyHappyAndHip.com. Now, back to Busy, Stressed, and Food Obsessed. Here again is Lisa Lutan. Welcome back to the show, everybody. I'm here with Janine Roth, and we're talking about ways to make the shift with food. We're just about to hear about the third key to making this shift. So, Janine, take it away. Yes. This is about power. 
this key. It's about power, and it's about power within, not power over other people, but it about the power that you have that many of us give away to food. And I'll use my own self as an example here. When I first started this, when I realized I wasn't going to diet anymore, and I was, as I said, 80 pounds, I had gained those 80 pounds, I realized, or I actually wanted to find out what purpose my weight and this insane relationship with food was serving in my life. It didn't seem like it had a positive purpose at all. So I decided to flip it on its head and ask myself that if my weight could talk, what would it be saying? If food and weight had a positive role in my life, what would that be? And I realized that every time I got thin, um, I would throw myself at the most unavailable, nastiest men around. Feel not They weren't nasty in the sense that they were abusive, but there was no way that these men were ever going to love me or want me because they w- didn't. And my role in life was if I can convince them to love me, then I must be lovable. And that took up a lot of all of my creative energy as one at, you know, pursuits like that do. And so I realized that weight, was my way of feeling so unattractive that I wasn't going to throw myself at anybody. And because of that, I focused on my writing. I joined a writing group. I started writing, which is something I'd always wanted to do. I got my first piece published in an anthology a couple years after that, and I wrote my first book. Now, now that didn't happen. Bum, bum, bum. And there was a lot of turmoil and trial and challenges in all of those things. But... I realized I had been giving the power to food that was, and my weight that was actually my own power. You know, there are a lot of men out there, um, I'm heterosexual, so this was about me and men, that like bigger women, women who had heft and pulchritude, as my uncle used to call it. And so it didn't necessarily make me unattractive, but because I was giving my weight the power to do that, I was giving it my power. That was my power. Uh, And so when I realized that I could lose weight, be at my natural weight, and still not be in a relationship, it was an epiphany for me. And that's how I work with the people that I work with. We look at, and a lot of people are very reluctant to hear this because, no, it doesn't serve any purpose. No, it's a, I'm miserable. No, it's just a struggle. No. And I say to them, you know, I know you believe that, but you wouldn't be keeping it around if it had no positive purpose at all. And it could just be it's the only time you run into the bathroom, you have three kids under the age of six, and it's the only time you get to be alone when you eat. It's the one thing you do for yourself. But how about running into the bathroom for a minute or five when you've got child care and just sitting there and being by yourself? That's how a lot of moms get time by themselves. They go into the bathroom and they lock the door. Um, or stepping outside and taking a couple of breaths. There are many ways to do what we give power to food to do, and when you do it yourself, when you actually let yourself have your own power, and that's what we're talking about here, there's nothing like it. And why do you that, think? Just to why go back, think, th- those are the shifts that those three keys are what I see the people who have made long-lasting shifts with food have done. They have taken the power back from their weight and, and therefore lost weight. They've learned how to be with, be kind to themselves in difficult moments, and they've reclaimed the connection to their bodies. Why do you think we give so much power to the scale? Um, because we learn that, because we all have swallowed whole the belief that thin people are happier people, which is, and we want to be happy. And we make the scale our measurement of that. Um, But it's not true, as I say many times, if thin people, if thin equals happiness, then there would be no miserable thin people. None. Do you advise people to throw away their scales or do you think I have really since the beginning, but not everybody's comfortable with that. So, you know, I leave that up to people. I no longer dictate. I mean, I feel very strongly about certain things and I'll say it. But, you know, some people feel like they can't live without their scale. And it's like, okay, 
Just notice the effect that that has on you. I think what's important here is to get your life back, to take it back from your relationship with food and weight and the obsession because what happens with people is that they they end up not having lives anymore. They live obsessed with food. It drains their creativity. It drains their capacity for intimacy. It just drains their work. I mean, it's a deep, deep cost here. We're dissociated. We, we end up not being present for our gorgeous lives until the moment, you know, many people, and I, um, I've myself, I'm always reading about these stories about regrets on deathbeds. And believe me, not one story I've ever read, and I've probably read more than 50, nobody has mentioned, I wish I had lost weight. I wish my thighs were thinner. They say things like, I wish I had showed up more. I wish I had realized that just the ordinary life, just being able to breathe and walk and talk and touch my kid's hair, how come I never saw that until now when it's too late? So, so true. So talking about all this transformation, I'd love to hear about your retreats and how you help people, women and men too, to start this transformation in their relationship with food and life. Well, there's um, something about, about doing something, whether it's streaming online or going to a workshop um, and following along with it if you're doing it streaming online, and we are going to offer that for a workshop coming up in March, um, a, st- a streaming capacity, there's something about dedicating yourself to what you long for, to what you want most, to being in an environment where that's what's being talked about, that's what's being pointed to, that's what's being encouraged, that's what's being supported. We rarely give ourselves that kind of time. Many people feel like it's a luxury, and I maintain that it's a necessity. And so at the workshops and the retreats, we, that's what our focus is. That's what we do all the time. That's what every moment is about, looking at all the ways First of all, questioning the beliefs we have. Most of us take our beliefs for granted, beliefs about ourselves. I'm doomed. I'm a failure. I'm damaged. There's no way I'll ever lose weight. I don't know how to do this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible person. I'm the most selfish person in the world. Whatever the thoughts are, we have these secret, shadowy thoughts and beliefs about ourselves. Those We question those in the workshop by doing a couple of different kinds of exercises. So we do things in the moment that question the underpinning of our relationship to ourselves because, as we said in the beginning, Lisa, that's what this is all about. It's about our relationship to ourselves, and our relationship to food is only an expression of that and what we believe we deserve or don't deserve. And then there, um, so we talk about the underpinnings and then so people do exercises together or for people at home, I encourage them to do their version of it, uh, to write things down or to perhaps do a streaming workshop together with somebody else and be able to talk about it. It's so helpful to know you're not alone. That is so, so important. So important. And that's different. Even doing something streaming online is really different than just reading through your Facebook feed or reading the Twitter posts that you've gotten the, and the Instagram posts and, you know, or your Twitter feed. It's just so different than that because you're still solitary. You're not connected. There's no live presence there. The power of community is so, so huge. So important. So can I share something, a big connection I made at your retreat? Absolutely. I'd love to hear that. <laughs> there, were, there were many, but I remember this one. I don't even remember the activity, but I remember the aha, where I made this connection that 
I never was a big dinner person. Like I, I really don't love dinner as far as meals go. I prefer breakfast and lunch. And it was just kind of a pain. I'm always like, Ugh, I don't want to go out to dinner, all this stuff. Well, sure enough, when I was growing up, the dinner table was really unpleasant. You know, it was debate, yeah, right. it was, you, there was shame, you felt bad, I hated it. And making that realization that dinner was not a pleasant experience for me and how that has morphed now as an adult was huge, really huge. Yes. I, I, and because it is big. that Those are the kind of connections that you make at workshops. Um, that you wouldn't make on your own because you've lived with them for so long and they've just become part of the whole story of me. And, and so they need to be questioned. I feel like it's very important to question them. Yeah, Which and I do agree. Doing at yeah, the, at I think that when you're in that environment, it is just so powerful. I can't say enough about it, and I'm really excited. So what will you be talking about at this upcoming live event on the 17th? Yes, it's the 17th and 18th, and um, the evening of the 17th and the day of the 18th, and the streaming part will be available, I think, for a couple of weeks. I'm not exactly sure how long right now, but I will be talking about these ships that we've talked about, those three in particular that we've talked about, how to make them, what to do. We'll be questioning... um, the thoughts, the beliefs, will be talking about the kind of support that's important to have after the workshop is over, actions that you can take every single day, how you can put this into action immediately. So that's what we'll be talking about. And there will also be students I've worked with um, who are coming as assistants, and I, I will probably ask them to talk about how they made the ship so people can really hear in a concrete, step-by-step way how to make these ships. This is so exciting. Will we be doing experiential learning like you do oh, in your yes, live retreat? Oh, yes, of retreats? course. Absolutely. I, so do we I, need to gather a friend to bring? It would be helpful to have a friend um, I mean, that would be very helpful, but also it's helpful to have a piece of paper and a pen if your friend isn't there or if you don't have a friend to write down. There's, there are always ways to do this besides having a friend, um, and, and one of them is to write down the answers or the thoughts or the feelings you're having with the questions that I ask because there will be ample time for that. Well, I am super, super excited. Janine, can you tell everybody your website so if they want to get in contact with you? Yes, certainly. It's JanineRoth.com, and it's G-E-N, and and most people spell it wrong. They hear Janine, and they start with a J. Um, JanineRoth.com, G-E-N-E-E-N-R-O-T-H.com. And I think it's on the events page. You can find it there. It's the San Francisco event. It's the 17th and 18th. And um, you can sign up for it there. And I will also post the link on my website as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, I just, yeah, it's on the homepage actually. And then it's actually on the events page too. I just did that. Yeah. So you can see it there. Great. Well, Janine, I can't even tell you what an amazing pleasure it's been having you on the show today. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. I, I, you know, like you, I could talk about this all day long <laughs> because it's so much to do with life, and and it's it's so important. I just want everybody to have their lives, to get their lives back, to know the goodness and the loveliness that's possible for them now. That's beautiful. I love that. I'm I'm going to pay that forward to the world and everybody else out there, too. So thank you, all listeners, for joining us today. It has been, again, such a treat for me. I hope it's been a treat for you as well. Please visit me at healthyhappyandhip.com. That's www.healthyhappyandhip.com. Drop me a note. Tell me what you thought about the show. Let me know what you're thinking in general. And I will be back again next week. Take care. 
We hope you've enjoyed today's episode on busy, stressed, and food obsessed. Did you get some great ideas from today's show? Join Lisa Lutan again next Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time and 12 noon Eastern Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Have a great week. Thanks again for listening to the preceding program brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check out additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the preceding program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect.